Warning! Spoilers for Infinity War incoming. <laughs> Look at all the YouTube channels just starving for clicks. Too many channels to watch them all, but to snuff them all out at once instantly? That is a mercy. With a snap of my fingers, half of all YouTube channels will disappear. <laughs> I can sit contentedly and watch as... Oh, what's going on? Oh, no! No! They all had second channels! Welcome to Film Theory, where, let's be honest here for a second, a top YouTube channel getting dusted overnight was probably the single best way to get people reinterested when they were just starting to get bored of the YouTuber. You know what wasn't boring, though? Infinity War. I gotta be honest, it was so much better than I expected. It was such a well-balanced movie, the perfect mix of action, humor, and drama. All that, and they crammed 60 characters in without making it feel rushed or bloated. It was so good, it had to have had Superman wedding his tidy whities or tidy reddies, I suppose. But perhaps most impressive of all was Thanos, easily one of Marvel's best villains, nay, best characters. For being this big bad mad titan, he was surprisingly relatable and sympathetic. Well, as much as he can be sympathetic and relatable for someone looking to wipe out half the population of the galaxy. If you're still with us but haven't seen the movie yet because all the theaters are still sold out, let me catch you up. Thanos, the giant purple... Uh, blue, uh, sorry, pink. Ah, fine. Thanos the Rainbow Titan watched as his planet became overpopulated and started to run out of basic resources. While he suggested a random culling of half his planet's population, the other Titans found this suggestion kind of mean, so they ignored it. Eventually, the planet couldn't find a solution and destroyed itself in the process, leaving Thanos with the universe's biggest case of I told you so. So to prevent other planets from experiencing the same fate, big Papa Thanos made it his life's work to randomly eliminate half the life of the universe. He mentions that he's done it once before on Gamora's home planet of Zen, and that it worked out pretty well. Um, since I don't have the clip from the movie, since it's still in theaters to prove it, uh, here's a dramatic recreation of that scene. I was a child when you took me. I see. <laughs> That's your Thanos? <laughs> It sounds like the Grinch. So I've been smoking a lot lately, okay? <laughs> I saved you. What? what? What's wrong with my Thanos? What do you want my Thanos? You're here, do you want me to be Gamora and you be Thanos? Here, let's do it that way then. I was a child when you took me. I saved you. No, no. We were happy on my home planet. Going to bed hungry? Scrounging for scraps? Your planet was on the brink of collapse! I was the one who stopped that. You know what's happened since then? The children born know nothing but full bellies and clear skies. It's a paradise. Because you murdered half the planet! A small price to pay for salvation. You're insane! And Earth is next on his hit list. At the end of Infinity War, we actually see Thanos succeed. Though, of course, that random culling process just so happens to specifically target those characters whose contracts aren't about to expire. But you know what? We're gonna give Thanos the benefit of the doubt here and assume that he isn't secretly working for some dark secret overlord. But here's the thing. For as absolutely insane as Thanos' plan sounds, and for as much as we as an audience don't believe what he's saying about the state of Gamora's home world, if you stop and look at the economics, statistics, and historical precedents, Thanos may actually be right. You heard that correctly. When you run the numbers, it turns out that Thanos the Mad Titan may not be as mad as you might think. 
First, let's talk population growth, since that's the underlying driver of all the economics here. There are two main population growth models that exist today, the exponential growth model and the logistic growth model. The exponential model basically says that as the population grows, the rate at which it grows will continue to increase and get faster, basically doubling every generation. And this kinda makes sense, right? If I have two kids and each one of those two kids have two kids, now there's four. Those four kids each themselves have two kids, and now there's eight. Each generation doubles. Or in science class, how you learn that one bacteria dividing every 20 minutes could produce 5,000 billion billion bacteria in just one day. Then you leave class and you never touch a doorknob again. But you can see that for humans, this doesn't really work. We all have different numbers of kids, or no kids, or we live in a place in the world where it's illegal to have more than one kid. As a result, there's the logistic population model, where population growth begins slowing at a certain point, reaching some type of upper limit called the carrying capacity. Usually, this is the result of environmental factors. In the case of bacteria, it might be the walls of the petri dish. You just run out of room. And for a lot of demographers, the people who study human populations, they believe we have a carrying capacity too, specifically around 11 to 12 billion people. Now, that sounds like it's a lot, but remember, we're at 7.3 billion people right now, so we're actually not that far away. The idea that we would slowly approach the carrying capacity of Earth was first possible posited by 18th century demographer Thomas Malthus. If you want to learn more about Malthus and the philosophy of Thanos, watch the musical Urine Town. Anyone? Anyone? No? No one's interested in a delightful musical romp through a world where you have to pay to pee? Fine! Then watch the Wisecrack channel who did an excellent video on that very topic that you can watch right here after the theory's over. Don't worry, I'll link to it during the end screen so you won't forget to watch it. The TLDR of Malthus's theory, or Malthusianism, is that quote, the power of population is indefinitely greater than the power in the earth to produce subsistence for man. Or, as Thanos put it, It's simple calculus. This universe has finite resources. Finite. If life is left unchecked, life will cease to exist. It needs correcting. But Thanos factored in something that Malthus didn't, and that is carrying capacity. With humans, our carrying capacity of 11 to 12 billion comes less from the restrictions of the environment and more from our own economic behavior. The global birth rate has been dropping since the UN started keeping track of it back in the 1950s, falling from 37.2 births per thousand people in 1950 to 1955 to 19.4 births per thousand people as recently as 2010 to 2015. That is a huge difference, and you can't blame declining resources for it since over the same period, the gross world product increased over 19 times, from about 4 trillion to about 77 trillion. So what's the problem here? Well, it's infant mortality, or should I say lack thereof. It may seem strange that more babies living would actually cause a population to decrease, but here's the thing. Your great-great-grandparents lived in a much rougher world than we do. They lived at a time where, unfortunately, it was just very unusual for all your children to live into maturity. Each child that did live, however, could help you work your land or manage your home when it was unlikely that you could afford to hire much labor on your own. You could also marry your children off for dowries or political capital. And because of all of this, it was socially advantageous to have as many children as possible. However, nowadays there are just far fewer economic advantages to having kids, which is admittedly a terrific thing for me to be saying when my wife is pregnant. But seriously, it's true. There aren't dowries anymore. If anything, your child is likely to cost you money on the wedding, and the education, and while they live in your basement looking for a job. And speaking of that, time is another key factor here, as the amount of time that we spend raising each child has historically trended upwards. If your medieval father didn't show up to your Pony League jousting tournament because he was too busy fighting the Crusades or whipping the serfdom into shape, literally and figuratively, well, that was just expected. But if your modern day father here in 2018 misses just one Little League baseball game because of his work, you're gonna get yourself a lifetime movie of the week. He was so neglected as a child. We can actually see this playing out on the world stage today, where many of the most economically developed countries' populations are stalling. Japan had record low numbers of children at just around 15 million this year. And in Europe, the average couple only has 1.6 children. That's not even enough to replace the existing generation. Collectively, this means that the 
human population is no longer growing exponentially like many of the fear-mongering news outlets proclaim. In fact, since 1960, we've had absolutely zero exponential growth whatsoever. We've had an absolutely linear growth. And this is the crux of Thanos' plan. You see, if the human population were still growing exponentially, well then Thanos' plan would have only set the world's population back by a single generation, or about 25 years. But because our birth rate is dropping and our population growth is linear, it's a good indicator that we've moved past the midpoint of this logistic curve, known as the point of maximum growth. What that means is that humanity is done growing at this accelerated rate, and instead we're moving towards a flat, no-growth population. In short, it doesn't really matter how many people live on Earth as long as we're able to sustain our current lifestyle. So if you cut the population in half at this period in time, you effectively also cut the maximum population in half, meaning that Thanos' plan would actually have a permanent impact. So, for a guy who looks like a linebacker who's taken one too many hits to the face, he's actually really thought this out. On top of all this, in Thanos' model, the scientific and cultural advances that have been made aren't removed from the world, and so the world, in theory, continues forward at about the same rate of advancement, just with a carrying capacity of 6 billion instead of about 11 billion. 6 billion, by the way, fewer people than we have on Earth today. Honestly, even though I was researching this, I couldn't believe it. I was a bit skeptical so I kept digging. You see, Thanos employs basic laws of supply and demand to say that when half the demand is removed, by removing half the population, prices should plummet. This seemed to me like it was a bit of an oversimplification, but believe it or not, historical evidence supports Thanos in this too. Now, there's obviously no real-world example where half the population literally disappeared in a snap, but we do have a very well-documented situation where about a third of Europe died in a matter of a few years. Years, the Black Death. There are some very interesting things that happened to the European economy as a result of the Black Death that weirdly made some European lives better. And I can already hear the vitriol in the comments. Let me make it clear, no one here is saying, Yay, Black Death! Woo, what a great idea! This is all in the name of social science and Marvel movies. This economic history article on the Black Death notes that the general wages rose by 40% in the years following the Black Death, while at the same time, rents for property actually plummeted, since there were fewer people to occupy houses or work land. This meant that the demand for houses fell, and as a result of falling demand, the price of homes followed suit. Since people needed to farm less land to feed fewer people, land that was once needed for crops before was suddenly diversified into ranching, increasing the supply of manure and meat, which in turn increased the output of the land that existed and even further drove down food costs. Food prices dropped about 15% on the whole in the years immediately after the plague. So lower food costs, lower housing costs, and higher wages. The people that were left kind of benefited from all of that death. Thanos and his twisted brain could conceivably call that a paradise, where those who remained thrived. Who knows? Maybe in this situation a millennial would actually be able to afford a house. So are we looking at a potentially real victory here under Thanos' rule? Well, it's kind of hard to know for sure, because when it comes to economics, there are all sorts of dominoes knocked down the line that can cause a massive amount of blowback. With a huge global crisis like Thanos' snap and falling prices, it changes the picture for a lot of these same issues. For instance, with the costs of having a kid much lower and a huge depopulation of Earth, people would likely feel a pressure to have more kids than they currently do, potentially pushing the carrying capacity higher than where it currently is as we jumpstart our growth rates again. China, now less concerned with over population would start to loosen their population control laws, as well as many of the other environmental laws that may be helping to slow the effects of things like global warming today. And the rest of the world would probably follow suit. Also, interestingly enough, Earth would most likely close off its doors. Its atmosphere. Space port things. Basically, it wouldn't let other aliens in. Because, you know, the first few aliens to make it to Earth all tried to kill us. That sort of xenophobia would likely set Earth back in terms of becoming culturally integrated into the rest of the galaxy. Too bad you can't build a wall around an entire planet. Actually, I think you can. It's called a 
force field. Economic solutions aren't a snap, literally or figuratively. The fun thing about this episode is that it was a fun thought experiment. It doesn't matter, it was simply a test of math and statistics. But at the end of the day, human life is priceless. Killing off half a population is never a solution. Plus, let's all face it, there's no denying that Thanos is definitively a mad titan because guess what? There is an easy solution here. You just snap your fingers and double everything. Or why stop there? You make it infinite. Seriously, Thanos, you have yourself a gauntlet of unstoppable power. Think outside the box. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And and remember that Wisecrack video I mentioned midway through the episode? Boom! There it is on screen. I love the guys over at Wisecrack, and if you enjoy these sorts of pop culture thought experiments, well then you're gonna love their channel. This is their assessment of the philosophy of Thanos, which is insanely interesting. So honestly, do yourselves a favor. If you enjoyed this video, which obviously you did, you made it to the very end of it, click the button you see on screen right now, give it a watch, learn something new, and tell them that MatPat sent ya. Give the video a watch. If you enjoy it, give them a subscribe. They are one of the most deserving channels on YouTube, producing some of the smartest content out there. At a time when, honestly, the algorithm makes it really hard to do smart educational content. So show them some love. And, uh, that's about it. In case you missed it, here's my prediction theory on Deadpool, which we'll see if it comes true in the next couple days. And I will see you all next Tuesday.